That's right. That's why, right. Serve Week has begun, and we are really, really excited about it all across our campuses. This is one of the best times of the year where we get to serve alongside each other, loving people, whether it's widows, widowers, inmates, people in our community, serving coffee to teachers, doing all sorts of different things with our life groups and dream teams. And can we go ahead and get excited about all the work that Jesus is going to do through us this week? Let's do it again. Come on, it's gonna be amazing. We're gonna see him do all sorts of things. And we're not a group of people that just do, do, does like random acts of kindness, but who we are are random, we're not so random servants of kindness. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Esther chapter four. That's where we're gonna be camping out. And I can't wait to see all that he does. Uh, people are gonna get saved, man. People are gonna start coming to our church, but, but the thing is, it's not for Emmanuel Baptist Church's name that we do this, we do it for Emmanuel, the one who came down to serve us, not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many, and what an honor it is to be a part of that many, that we've been transformed to be servants of kindness. Starting in verse one, Esther chapter four, it says, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them laid in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her the queen was deeply distressed, she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. And so right out of the gate, we see that there is an incredible need. There's an incredible needs in Persia, and there's incredible needs all across the world, even in our community, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But the Persian Empire stretched all the way from eastern India to Ethiopia. It was a huge landmass, but in comparison to the United States, maybe it's not so large, especially when you combine it with Alaska. It's huge, it's massive. But the difference is that makes Persia really stand out across all of human history is the amount of people that were living in Persia. One third of the population of the world lived in Persia. So they had incredible amounts of influence. To try to compare it with the United States, only 4.35% of the world lives here in the States. And so a lot of times we think because this is where we live and this is really a, a lot of the, the only people that we're interacting with, we, we think really this is the center of the world. But Persia, back then, was the center of the world. But to understand just a couple things, this was 500 years before Jesus touched down in the city of Bethlehem, born in a manger. And they were under the reign of the Persians who ended up conquering Babylon, who conquered Assyria, and all of these nations, they ruled over the Jews and dispersed them across, during this time, 127 provinces, which today we would probably call them states. Now Esther, this story, is happening in between two different books within the Bible. Ezra is used by God and the group of people to rebuild the temple, and then you have Esther's story, and then following after it is Nehemiah. God used him to rebuild the wall. And so as we jump into this, it's very important that we get to understand the people in Persia. The first person we're introduced to is a guy by the name of Mordecai. And Mordecai was the uncle and the adopted father of a young Jewish, beautiful orphan girl by the name of Esther. And Esther was really the name that everyone knew her as, but she had another name given to her when she was born, and it was Hadassah. That was her Hebrew name. But everyone knew her as Esther, and God sovereignly placed Esther into a very, very important position. So important that Mordecai would say it's for such a time as this. See, God placed her to be into the role of being the most powerful woman all across the globe. She was, in fact, the wife of the king, which made her the queen of Persia. 
And we're gonna see, really, what, what was the reason why God would place her in such a position? Another guy that's a part of the story is a man named Haman, and he was second in command under the king. Everyone thought that Haman was a very important individual, and so every time you see him walking through the streets or he's riding on a donkey, a colt, coming through town, everyone bows down in showing respect. Now, it's not as though they were worshiping him because the king really wanted everyone to worship him. It wasn't that they were worshiping him, but at the same time, there was one individual that refused to bow down in front of Haman, and it drove Haman nuts. The guy who refused to bow down was Mordecai. And Haman stayed up late at night, week after week. Every single time he would see Mordecai, he thought about wanting to take him out. And then he found out that Mordecai was a Jew, and so he started to think about, how do I not only take out Mordecai, but take out all of the Jews all across the empire? This is a dangerous, horrible situation that would cause Mordecai to tear his clothes and to be in great despair, to lay himself in front of the king's gate. King Ahasuerus was a very wicked king. And a lot of times, you know, the only way, see Haman, Haman tried to get this decree to be signed by the king and they sent Mel out all across uh, the empire and it was almost like there was a government official showing up to your house and you have a loved one that is in the military and they open the door and, and you can just see the spouse, whether it's the husband or the wife, kind of fall to their knees and realize, oh no, my, my loved one, my spouse has been shot and killed. But this was so bad that it wasn't just that one individual was taken out, but the decree was signed by the king saying that everyone that you know is getting ready to die. It's a, it's a very, very fearful situation where everyone was almost going nuts. And the reason why is because it was signed by the king. And what kind of, who, who could change the decree of the king? The only one who could do that was the king. And he usually wouldn't do it because it would look bad on his name. He would be a man that would be kind of soft and not willing to keep his word. The king was very self-centered, a pleasure-seeking kind of king. We read about it in chapter one. He throws a party that lasts for six months, y'all. It's for every single person that serves underneath his reign, that's his employees, and it, throughout the whole time, it wasn't really to uh, cause the people who work for him to, to show them that he was appreciative of them, but what ended up happening is he, he did all of this so that they might see how great he was. So they were eating of the king's table. They were drinking from cups that were made out of gold, even sitting on couches made out of gold. I don't know really how comfortable that was, but it was all for his own glory. It was that everyone would see how powerful and how great the king was. After the 180 days, he goes ahead and throws a seven day party for everyone in the capital. It doesn't matter how great or small you were, whatever you wanted, you could almost get. He said there was one rule, there is no compulsion. And so however much wine you wanna drink, everybody was drunk as skunks and, and doing whatever they wanted, which was, is very, very dangerous in a society, especially in a man's world, which is what Persia was. He was so bad that when he was drunk one night, he asked for his wife to come around and prance around, dance around, displaying her beauty to all the other drunk men. And you would have thought that this king, when he would sober up the next morning, he'd go and apologize. But what did he do? Instead, he was convinced by other individuals that he should go ahead and divorce his wife, kick her out of the palace, and he would remember her no more. And so if the king was this wicked to his own wife, how in the world would he consider the needs of the small little Jewish people who he's just sent out a decree to wipe them out. And so when Mordecai learned all this, he tore his clothes, laid in sackcloth and ashes. And, and a lot of times in our society, we say when you're going through hard things, people process grief differently. But back then, a lot of people were taught how to grieve. And so they would physically grieve by tearing their own clothes. They would emotionally grieve by just laying out on the streets and weeping and wailing, screaming in great distress. And spiritually, they would do what they call lament, which lament is basically a biblical practice that helps one remember the feelings, the reality of what they're going through, the feelings, 
but also not forget the facts of what God is doing in their life. For an example, Psalm 13, it starts off with something like this. You know, how, how in the world can, can I move on? Because it feels like that you have forgotten me. You've, you've hidden yourself from me. That's how Psalm 13 starts off. You've hidden yourself from me. And a lot of times that's, that's how we feel when we're going through grief. But then he ends with Psalm 13. He, he, he remembers the steadfast love of the Lord never fails and it always continues. See, in our communities, there's a lot of need. A lot of need. And one of those things is 2,300 people in our state die every single year from overdose. And to wrap our minds around that number, when you take Madison Central High School, which is where our Richmond campus is uh, located in Madison County, when you combine students and faculty, there's around 2,300 people in that. And so just imagine that amount of people, a great tragedy hitting them to where every single year a whole school is knocked out. Because that's a real reality of what's taking place. But yet many of us, we, we show favoritism and we think that there's greater worth in certain people based on the decisions people make. And so this number just kind of passes us by really quick without us feeling like we need to be involved in some manner in solving it. Human trafficking in Kentucky is, is very, it's becoming more and more common. It's not just something that happens across the globe, but it's something that happens here in Appalachia. 60% are kids that are forced into labor or sex. Women are a part of that. And, and catch this, it's a, a lot of times it's immigrants with little to no English that are very, very vulnerable to the persuasion of these individuals. They often would say something like this, hey, if you show up uh, at this place at this time, I'll give you a job that's, that's better, that's better. And then they show up and all of a sudden they're kidnapped and forced into whether it be pornography, hotels, illegal spas, or even random homes across our state. People are lonely and isolated. Children, a lot of times we're growing up and they're they're less likely today to take care of their family. And so you have nursing homes packed full of widows and, and widowers, but their family is nowhere to be found. Even children, I've heard it said from those who work in the school system that sometimes children are sent home with lunches uh, every single day, sometimes especially during the weekend, uh, so that it might be able to hold them over until the following day or the Monday where they can get breakfast again because they don't have a whole lot of food in their cabinets. And guess who ends up eating a lot of it? It's their own parents. I mean, we live in a society that's it's pretty wild. It's kind of nuts. We forget that sometimes. But it's not just them outside. It's us in here. All of us have been church hurt in some form or fashion, had a conversation that didn't go really the way that we planned. And, and this, is, this is a common thing. I, I know of a person who's 77 years old and this gentleman still refuses to become a Christian because his dad served as a pastor on the weekends, but all throughout the week beat him. And this is still going on. You know, oftentimes, God calls us to intervene where there's need. But we, a lot of times, offer a Band-Aid when it should be, like, it's a fatal wound. This guy's not gonna make it. And that's what happens in verse two with Esther. She tries to comfort her uncle by giving him a change of clothes, but it's gonna cost more. What's it gonna cost her in verse eight through 11? Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went out and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes into the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. It's very important for us to understand Esther's decision. Like, what, what's her options? You know, one of her options could be put up or shut up. You know, she could put up and decide to go against the king, secretly bringing a dagger in and maybe taking him out. But that wouldn't have been probably a very good plan in a man's world. 
She could have shut up. She could have tried to hide herself into the palace, which is often what the queen would do anyways, just hoping that the storm might pass by. It would have been an incredible temptation for her to do so. Or she could have shut down Mordecai. She could have sent some troops with Hathach as he communicated the message to him and went ahead and just tried to silence him, maybe threaten him a little bit. Or she could have stooped down, and that's in verse eight. This is the request her uncle made of her, is what I want you to do is I want you to beg for his favor. Now to beg and favor are the exact same words in the Hebrew language. And so what Mordecai is asking her to do is to, to stoop down and giving basically a kind request to the king. Not to forcefully say it, not to rudely say it. Don't you know I'm a Jew? You know, you shouldn't have sent out this decree, but to humbly come before him and to kindly request that she would be spared as well as all of the Jews. And what, what she's doing is she's stooping down to show kindness to him and she is basically asking for him, figuratively speaking, to stoop down and to show kindness to her and all of her people. It was not a handout, but it was a hand up. You know, handouts are very, very easy and quick. And we're very prone to help people through handouts, but what this was was a hand up. And hand ups are always much more difficult. They last longer, it requires a relationship. And so as we go out and serve week, let us not just be focused on pulling weeds, but let us be focused on the person who we're serving. When you're out doing a block party, may it not be just about the event, but about the person. We say this as a staff, people are more important than projects. Listen, when people see it, sense that they're merely a project to you, man, it's, it's, so, it's so, like, it's even worse than if you didn't serve them in the first place. Because it comes just from a deceitful, heart that looks to get something rather than, than to be genuine to them. And this is what is being asked of Esther. What will she do? Will she give in to God's calling or will she give in to her own comfort? We say here at Emmanuel, his calling's greater than our comfort, so what is she gonna do? Well, Esther's names have, have different meanings. So Esther is one name that we already said and, and she went by this name. In Esther chapter two, verse 10, we read, Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And this was important so that she might preserve her life, the Jewish people might preserve their lives. And this is often what we do. When it's going to cost us, we try to stay hidden, which is what Esther's name means. Jewish rabbis in what they call the Talmud says that more than likely Esther's name connects mostly with this, with this word in Hebrew that says to hide or conceal. And that's what she was known to do. And that's what she's even trying to do in this story. You can see it. She tells Mordecai, don't you know the rule, the law, that if I go in front of the king and he's not asked for me, he could take off my head. I could die right then and there, and for the last 30 days, I've not even seen the king. She's trying to preserve her own life, which is what many of us in the room would be prone to do as well. Or will she be like Hadassah? Now Hadassah, that name means a myrtle tree, and myrtle tree is known throughout history as being a beautiful tree that has incredible fragrance. And so Jewish rabbis tend to believe that this is what really the story is talking about, is it will, will Esther be like who she's been and hide and conceal, giving in to her own comforts, or will she do something beautiful to where she, her good works would be like flagrance that would kind of spread across the empire, bringing physical salvation to everyone? What will she be? You know, all of us have this war going on inside of us. All of us, and to have vital Christian faith, J.C. Ryle said this, you and sin must quarrel if you and God are to be friends. Every single one of us. Now it's not necessarily to be saved, because we know Jesus earns our way to salvation, but if you wanna have close connection, close friendship with Jesus, all throughout your day, it's going to require that you go to sin, or you go to war with your sin. It's, it requires it because every single one of us have this war going on inside of us. Every, every one of us have our heart that's prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And it happens all the time. 
What's the plan? Verses 12 through 14. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews for another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now what Mordecai is talking about is that, Esther, if you don't step up to the plate, what's gonna happen is your family line is going to finish. There will be no more relatives. Your line will be finished, which means your father's household will also perish. It's just gonna end, which was a huge ordeal back then. But something very interesting that uh, Mordecai mentions is he, he gives the difference between God's will of decree and God's will of desire. See, God's will of decree will happen. He has a plan that's going to take place. None of us can thwart the purposes of God. None of us can change his plans. It's already written in stone. This God is, has orchestrated these events. But there is a difference between what he desires. And all of us, every single day, escape God's will of desire when we sin, when we step out, when we're not brave in that moment, or when we have impure motives within the heart. But no matter what, what, what he's stating here is God's made a promise all the way back to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations will be blessed. And so maybe there's a lot of Jews that are gonna be taken out here, but God will preserve his people, even if it be a remnant, a small group of people, because Jesus is going to come from this line and do what we all know that he has done that we'll talk about in a moment. So how does she respond? Let's continue. Verse 15 through 17 to finish. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold fast on my behalf, hold a fast, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So by, by asking everyone to fast and pray, what Esther was acknowledging is that she needs the support and fellowship of other people. And so do we. None of us in the room can single-handedly meet every single need in the world. That's why we're family. That's why we're a body of Christ. We all work together to meet these needs so that Jesus might be known. But also, number two is that she depends on more than human courage. You know, courage can get you places. Courage can get you Medal of Honors, it can get you ribbons, it can even get you movies uh, written about you. But sometimes courage just doesn't cut it. It's kinda like me, if I went into the weight room, which is a big if, all right, it's a very big if, but if I placed a lot of weight on the bench press or whatever it's called, the bar, and I, I were to lay down and, and I would try to lift that up, it would crush me. Courage wouldn't, it, it, didn't, it wouldn't matter how much like monster drink I drank or whatever energy drink you wanna, you wanna name, I, I still wouldn't be able to get it off my chest, which is why I would need someone to spot me. And all of us need others to spot us as we serve and engage with people. Charles Spurgeon said something like this, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence, God's power. But she had courage nonetheless. She says, if I perish, I perish. Now it's not a statement that kind of is like what I state sometimes, it is what it is, like it's just gonna happen. It's almost like negative. But what she's stating is, is that, hey, Mordecai and the Jews, if you're going down, I'm going down with you. Amazing. And so Esther does respond. She steps in front of the king's court and instead of you know, him bringing the gavel down, he waves the golden scepter, and she not only has her life spared, but all of the Jewish people, and it's an incredible story. There's much more to the story than what we can say uh, at this time, but man, you should read it later this afternoon. It'll take you like 15 or 20 minutes. But I do wanna address the skeptics in the room to finish up. Skeptics a lot of times will say, Christians need stories like these in order to make them basically be good people. And they often will say, if that works for you, then that's fine. But I don't need such a story to be kind to people. And it's true, in a sense. You can't, you, you oftentimes, 
may, may even outmatch a lot of us as Christians. It's sad to say that a lot of times non-Christian citizens are better citizens in America than Christians. I hate to say that, but it's true. But there's a guy by the name of Vladislav Rostorotsky, and I do plan on saying that again. I had to practice that one. But um, he was a Russian man who was world-renowned for being a gymnast coach for women. And he once stated this, talent is not enough. I believe that a really good gymnast is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And so it's true, you can be kind and you can make this place a happier place. You can. If that's what life is really all about, for, for you to do good so that others might feel good, it, it can happen. But I do wanna say this, that in God's perspective, all of our good deeds are but filthy rags, so it's not gonna get you anywhere on his terms. But I will say this, that all of us is human nature. When we're doing things that are kind, there's a inward dialogue going on. And that inward dialogue goes something like this. Hey, I'm doing something nice here, and I feel like I'm a little bit nicer now. I feel like I'm a little bit more kind. Kind of swell up a little bit with pride after a project is done. You serve someone. And a lot of times that, that can happen. Either some other, somebody else comes and pats you on the back, makes you feel good, or, or you, get, you go ahead inwardly and give yourself a pat on the back, and it's just normal. Every single person in the universe does this. Or it could be on the other side where you, you, you go into despair. It's not that you're proud. It's that you never can do enough. There's always more needs and you feel like you just never measure up and it, you grow to despair. And so what takes place is externally somebody might be serving and meeting a need. But inwardly, what's happening is there's distance being created between the two people because either you feel really good about yourself, which makes you feel better than the, the person that you're serving, or you feel horrible and like, oh man, I gotta keep up and do the next thing. I gotta be a part of every single project during serve week to just kind of measure up, go, 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 go. And it, it creates distance between the two. You would agree with me, skeptics and Christians in the room, you would agree with me that if someone were to, were to be externally serving someone, but internally their heart's not in it, that that's not a great thing. It's actually a deceitful hypocrite, which is all of us in the world, we struggle with it. But Rostorotsky said this, and he, he went on a hunting trip, and it, it was supposed to last for a week. And he ended up coming back early, came back on a Sunday, rolled in on a Monday into the gym, and he, he made a statement like this to some of the folks that were in the gym. He said, man, you should have seen what I saw. There I was in the bushes. All of a sudden, this elk appears, and its antlers were like as large as branches of trees. It was huge. And then he just paused, and there was some time, and, and then the gymnast would ask a question that you would probably wonder, well, well did you get it? Now, in this moment, if he shot the elk and he, he got it, what would happen? He would swell up a little bit, even if it's just a little, with pride, and it would basically distance himself from the gymnast and maybe even other hunters if it was a great shot and great kill. But let's say he didn't. He, he actually shot, he shot and he didn't uh, kill, the, kill the elk. What would have happened? He probably wouldn't have even mentioned the story at all because he would have been embarrassed. What did he say? He said this, why should I shoot such a beauty? And that's the difference. That's, that's the deal for us as Christians. This man went into the woods one person to shoot the elk and he came and experienced beauty and he came out of the woods a completely different person. And that is the case for us as Christians. Beauty has changed us. See, the gospel isn't just good news, it's beautiful news. And it, it's not just beautiful news that we learn about, but it comes and lives inside of us and, and takes resonance and changes us to where we don't just do random acts of kindness. No, it comes from our heart. See, we have someone that's greater than Hadassah in our midst. He's more beautiful and his flagrance spreads not just across Persian Empire, but it has a spread across the entire globe all throughout history ever since he resurrected. Psalm 113, it says, who can be compared with the Lord our God who is enthroned on high? He stoops to look down on heaven and on earth. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes and even the princes of his own people. How in the world did Jesus do such a thing for us? 
How did he lift us up from our poverty and sin? Well, he was made low in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. How did he set us among princes? Well, he took the place of a servant. He walked into the king's court knowing this is what it's going to require of me. It's going to require my life. And he loved us in spite of our lack of kindness. He laid down his life. When the, when the golden scepter should have been waved towards Jesus, the gavel was brought down on him so that we might have life and have it forever. Amazing. See, Jesus is not just someone who inspires us, brother and sister. He's not merely our inspiration, but he is our perspiration. He not only cleans up our heart, but comes and lives inside of us. Galatians chapter five says what his fruit is like. What does he do through us? Well, it's love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And so this statement is very different. You know, oftentimes we think that a Christian is someone who merely serves others for Jesus, but that's not the case. That is not the gospel. The gospel is this, is that a Christian is someone through whom Jesus serves. Jesus is the one doing all of these acts of kindness, doing all of these things because we have seen beauty and it's changed us. I think of a, a person who is a part of our church, I'm not gonna mention names, but they work with International Justice Mission, which looks to end sex trafficking all across the globe. And they don't just worry about the person and, and serve the person's physical need, but they also try to meet spiritual needs. And I'm so thankful that I know I have a friend that works and is involved in such a great ambition. I, I know another guy who I just recently went with and he would, he would totally hound on me if I mentioned his name, but every other week he, would go, he goes consistently into a jail and offers a Bible study and loves on these men and nobody knows about it. He doesn't mention it to anyone and I just happen to hear it through the grapevine. I'm honored to know people like yourself who some of you, you don't serve on the dream team, but you are on the dream team. And you know why? Because you serve all throughout the week. I look across the room and I see you and I know the things that you are doing. Spreading the fragrance of Christ, the fragrance of Christ everywhere you go. And it's Christ in you. And what an honor it is. What an incredible adventure it is that Jesus would live in us and serve people continuously, whether it's during a week or a month or throughout the entire year. And so my invitation to us as, as we get ready to respond is this, non-Christian in the room, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And so if you see the beauty of Christ, you see how incredible he is, then come and follow him. Let it not be merely the wrath of God escaping the flames, but, but the attraction of him and the amazing things that he's done for your salvation, to die the death you deserve, to be buried and raised, for you to be made right with God. And then for Christians in the room, what I'm asking you to do is just like Esther, maybe it's not to fast for three days, but it's to come and pray. I'm asking you to come and pray by name for those that have needs in the community and maybe for all of those that we're going to be serving throughout this week. Let us be intentional, not to give handouts, but hand ups, building relationships with people, looking for this to move on further than a mere week. Will you stand as I pray?